last week, the Director General of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, Dr. Chikwe Ihekwazo, declared that a new evidence suggests that COVID-19 may be transmitted through the air. According to him, and I quote, understanding the modes of transmission of any new virus is very critical for defining response strategies. For COVID-19 from the very beginning, I understand them, based on other coronaviruses, was spread primarily through droplets. Droplets are excretions from the respiratory tracts that can stay on in the air. They ultimately fall to the ground after a few minutes. However, as we have studied transmission, studied clusters of these inf inf infections, we saw increasing evidence from clusters of infections. Clusters transmissions did not seem to be enough to explain the clusters that were seen. End of quote. Dr. Hekwazu further reiterated the need for Nigerians to wear face masks and strictly adhere to social distancing guidelines. To have a conversation around COVID-19 and its airborne possibilities, we are now being joined by Dr. Alero Ann Roberts, a consultant public health physician and senior lecturer at College of Medicine, University of Lagos. Dr. Roberts, good morning and welcome to The Morning Show. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's good to see you. Thank you. Well, quickly, uh, what are your thoughts on this latest revelation, both by the uh, World Health Organization and also the Nigerian Center for Disease Control, that uh, air trans airborne transmission is a possibility and that uh, face masks uh, should be very compulsory for everybody, particularly in enclosed spaces? Well, it is very clear from what we've been seeing over the transmission of the disease that this was a possibility right from the very beginning. You will recall that, you know, when we were making the uh, call for extra PPE for medical staff and, and doctors and nurses on the front line, that we did speak of procedures such as that we called aerosolizing procedures. That if you are intubating a patient or you're doing any surgery, even a cesarean section, that there were procedures that aerosolized the virus, which meant that it got into the air and could hang about in the air for a much longer period of time. You recall that we also talked about having negative pressure rooms for nursing patients so that we had a situation where the virus could be contained within the room or sucked out of the room and, and uh, safely destroyed. So this has always been a suspicion. However, and what we were waiting for essentially was the evidence to prove that this was happening. What this means to the common man and to all of us walking on the street is that, I'll give you a typical situation. You walk into a room that is not properly ventilated, sadly, such as the studio I'm sitting in. And if anybody has been expelling the virus, the chances are the virus remains in the air for much, much longer than previously anticipated. It doesn't just fall to surfaces and get wiped away as we had previously been ad advising, which makes it imperative that everybody wears a mask once they are not in their own safe zone, in their own uh, safe environment, their bedroom or their house. Thank you so much, Doctor, for that. Now, we've been talking so much, as you said earlier, even though this possibility of airborne transition always existed, the focus has been on droplet transmission. So please, can we just go through exactly what the risks are now that we've established that airborne transmission is possible? What are the situations that present the highest risk, for example? What are the environments? You've just talked about sort of the room that you're in now. Can we have more examples so people are really aware? So banking halls, churches and places of worship, classrooms, classrooms are a major problem, lecture halls, anywhere that is a closed space where a lot of people get in and stay for longer than 15, 20 minutes. So it's not as much of a problem at, say, a bus stop or, or maybe in the open markets, but it is a problem within a mall, within a... a, a a, a, a store, a grocery store or a, a supermarket that is enclosed and, and particularly where there's air conditioning because of course our environment is hot and a lot of people use air conditioning so windows don't get opened so often and you know breeze doesn't blow through the, the room to get rid of the virus so to speak. So these are the problems that you know the, the situations where people can run into danger of spreading the virus. Now Take a typical example. You meet up with your friends for a drink 
in a club or a, a, play, a closed space. Naturally, because it's your friend, you're going to, you want to talk, you want to gist, you're going to lean into each other, you're going to talk, you're going to laugh in each other's faces, and you're going to remove your mask and your face shield because you're going to have a drink and maybe something to eat. Those are the typical places that, you know, the spread has been very, very fast. And if you, re if you are watching the numbers in the U.S., you can see that the spikes in, in the n number of new cases are coming literally two weeks after major days that they celebrated, Memorial Day or July 4th, where they celebrated with huge gatherings of people not wearing face masks in closed and confined spaces, eating and drinking. And two weeks, 10 to 14 days later, boom, you have this spike in cases. Today they are reporting another historic uh, uh, new record of new cases in a single day. That's the danger that we face. That's why we've got, uh, you know, a lot of problems trying to advise how to open uh, clubs and bars and, and religious uh, facilities and schools. Schools are particularly painful, but there's, this is the situation we find ourselves in. Right. Doctor, I've got two questions for you. Number one, I'll tell the line of today. I, I want to know how this spreads. So once they say it's airborne, is it still you have to cough or you have to sneeze into the air or just by merely talking or breathing? Because I read some report that said by just breathing, you know, you've got COVID and you just breathe normally or you just say, OK, let me take a deep breath. And it goes out like that. Can, can you still put it in the air? Secondly, the, the planes have been a very contest contentious issue, the aircrafts, the fact that they say, oh, the air is constantly cleaned and things like that. Uh, there, was, there was even a report uh, yesterday that Dr. Abati was talking about, about United and Airlines trying to start, you know, selling the middle seat normally in the plane. What's the science behind that? Because all I see, correct me if I'm wrong, is I just see normal air conditioning system in the plane. So the cleaning of the air and things like that, I don't know what is going on. Well, the first question let me take. I mean, simply talking, breathing, laughing, singing. Okay, so breathing yes. out normally can breathing spread out COVID. Will, 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 well, breathing out will shed the virus. Probably not as far as coughing or sneezing. <laughs> but you're laughing. Look at you. You're laughing. That is spreading the virus much further than merely breathing. And it is very so, impossible. So breathing as, alone. <laughs> I'm done. Yes, yes, sadly, it does. <laughs> you know, that is definitely what the no, research stop, is showing. Stop, stop laughing. No, because it was, it, was a, it, <laughs> no, it was a contentious issue. I had this debate with somebody yesterday, and the person said breathing out can't spread. So, I, because once I heard it was airborne, well, now, I said, now, stop breathing. Now, stop breathing. The doctor has spoken. Don't stop breathing. They breathing can. Out spread. They can. <laughs> Dr. Roberts, please, please we're continue. with you. <laughs> <laughs> We're just scared, you know. <laughs> well, I think the, the, the word should be let's apply an overabundance of caution. And there's certainly nothing wrong with wearing a mask plus a face shield if you have one to prevent us putting more of the virus into the atmosphere. Because basically, if we can reduce the amount of virus in the atmosphere, we can eventually wipe this thing out. And that's basically the, the signs that we're, we're, we're pushing forward. As regards the aircraft, now I can't say I'm an expert on how the aircrafts are. Uh, the the uh, aircrafts are ventilated, but I do know that it's probably quite easy to install some kind of recirculating um, air conditioning system so that the air is constantly sort of being sucked out, passed through scrubbers, and then put back in. That That is simple health and safety engineering, and a lot of places do. We, we use it in the theatres, and I know that there's a lot of protocols we use in operating theatres that we actually took, learned from aviation, so I won't be surprised if they can, they find it quite easy well, to do. Dr. Roberts, at this point, let's take a, a short commercial break, and then we'll come back to you. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. It's still the money show. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on the Arise News Channel. Still with us is Dr. Alero Ann Roberts, a consultant public health physician and senior lecturer at the College of Medicine, uh, University of uh, Lagos. Well, uh, Dr. Roberts, thank you very much for staying with us. But with all of these revelations about what science is telling us, do you think that in terms of the management of the uh, COVID-19 in Nigeria, that both the federal government and the state governments have been following the science enough. Now that we hear that uh, airborne transmission is not just a possibility, but that it is real, 
what additional steps uh, do we need to take in Nigeria, where it will appear as if the ordinary man uh, has gotten over the fear of uh, COVID-19? What are your recommendations? Well, certainly I know that we've been advocating for the widespread use of face coverings and, you know, any, anything that covers the nose and mouth, certainly in a public place, is a very, very good idea. And I hardly ever say this, everybody knows me, but I would really like it to be sanctioned such that if you are found in public without a face covering, you can be sanctioned probably quite severely because this is for all our collective good. You know, the issue of whether to open religious places of worship and schools is a very, very touchy one. And I don't know that there's any sort of blanket directive that can be given, except that, you know, we've got to look at, the, look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. I know in Lagos State, the Lagos State Safety Agency is doing a really good job of looking at the individual businesses and SMEs and making sure that they can adhere to the public health interventions. I think this needs to be carried out, but it does require a lot of will, political will. It requires a lot of commitment. And I'm glad to say we have it in Lagos State. One wonders whether the other states can, can match up to this. We've got a lot of political will from the federal government. Now it's, re it's what is required is for us as individuals to decide that we do not want to be in the 20% that develop moderate to severe symptoms, and we certainly do not want to be a mortality statistic. So that requires for each and every one of us to now take on ourselves the collective responsibility of adhering to the public health non-pharmaceutical interventions. They remain the same. Avoid crowded places. Certainly crowded places in confined spaces are an absolute no-no. And the regular use of soap and water, hand washing, masking, use of face coverings to mask the nose and mouth. These are imperatives, and I think it's something that, as an individual, we just need to take it on board and just do it. Thank you, Doctor. I mean, you alluded to being a liberal person, and you're also a medical doctor, and you have saying that you would like sanctions to be put in place. That bears repeating and it bears stressing to really buttress the seriousness of what we're discussing here. So I'd like you to talk about the efficacy, or otherwise, of disinfectant sprays, because right now they're doing a booming business. Will spraying a disinfectant in the air kill COVID-19? I can't really say, because I confess I'm not very knowledgeable in that area, but it certainly makes scientific sense. However, the danger is that what kind of disinfectant is being used and can everybody tolerate it? So I don't know about the health and safety engineering aspects of it, but anything that, that lowers the amount of virus in the atmosphere can only be a good thing. Eventually, what I suppose would need to happen is the negative pressure or the cross-ventilation aspect. And these are things that engineering, um, air conditioner engineers are really very good at and can probably put in place. So they would make anything that disinfects would make a booming business right now. It's not a bad thing. No, but I, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think the way air conditioners work, they suck the air, uh, the ambient air around in, and they put out the cold air. I think that's the way it works repeatedly. Yes, but I think there's also an aspect of airflow that we now need to bring in, because what you want is unidirectional airflow. Okay, so you, you have to put cross ventilation into, to get that unidirectional airflow. And then you have to have filters that are being washed regularly in disinfectant, and you have to have scrubbers that you know, take the virus out of the air. So these are new innovations, new technologies that need to be explored. Okay. Well, we discussed earlier during the review of uh, headlines in uh, today's newspapers uh, the uh, touchy issue, I'm, I'm borrowing that word for, <laughs> from you of the reopening of schools and the recommendation by the House of Reps to the president that he should uh, uh, direct the uh, Minister of Education that schools should be reopened. Now, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think, look, it's better to just wait until COVID-19 goes before children return to school or life must just go on as uh, business people are insisting? You are right. It is a very touchy issue. And it's easy to say, oh, no, you know, let's be safe and let the schools remain closed. But we do have to remember that there's a huge divide in the educational sector right now between the children who are able to access online learning and those who are not. Plus, 
we all know that part of a child's education and upbringing does involve socialization, does involve being in a classroom setting and learning from peers, you know, the, the fine... The, fine arts of social niceties. So it's a really, really difficult question to answer. Because What I would think, because I have to speak now both as a public health uh, um, physician and as a mother, you know, would I be willing to allow my child to go back to school in this kind of situation? What sort of um, precautions and what sort of measures would I want to see put up in the schools before I'm comfortable to allow my child, or in my case, my grandchildren, to go to school. These are things that I think the important thing is that we must bring the voices from the grassroots to the dialogue table. You know, parent teachers associations, getting the voices of the parents involved. Because until the children go back to school, we cannot have businesses open as usual. What happens? Do, does, does a mother leave her child at home and then go off to look for her daily bread? What, so, schools are, the reopening of schools is very important, but being able to provide the safety measures. And the chief safety measure that needs to be put in place is water and sanitation hygiene. Running water for children to be able to wash their hands regularly, protect, protecting each other, protecting the teachers and the non-academic staff. If we can have a, gov a commitment from government to ensure that every school in every corner of the country has access to safe water and sanitation hygiene practices, then it'll be a lot easier to carry out this discussion. Thank you, Doctor. Now, we've touched on the issue of sanctions, but what else can the government do, federal and state government, what can they do to incentivize people to wear their masks and observe all the protocols that we've been discussing since COVID-19 started? Because according to the American CDC, if everybody was to wear a mask for one or two months, the pandemic would, come, would get in control. What can we do here to get that message across? Because it appears that with the easing of the lockdown, the general perception is that COVID is over and life can go back to normal. normal. <laughs> what trick are we missing here? Well, this is it. It's, again, the, 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 you, you, know, you know we have a saying, when in doubt, don't. Everybody is actually in doubt as to the seriousness of this disease, and therefore they don't want to wear a mask. Wearing a mask is uncomfortable. It does make your breathing, you know, it can be it's something you just have to get used to, and it takes a while to get used to it. I, you know, even in the medical profession, the surgeons do it all the time, and then we who don't go into operating theatres, I put on a mask, and after about an hour, two hours, I'm like, oh my goodness, where am I? Can't I take this thing off? But I think in terms of what the governments, federal and state, are doing, they're doing pretty much what they can do, short of turning us into a police state, which nobody would like or want. But I think what we can do to incentivize, as you say, is I have a carrot and stick approach to mask wearing, have a carrot and stick approach to uh, um, places having wash facilities, you know, reward those who have made the efforts. And there are lots of innovative efforts that are being made and sanction those who are not making the effort. So, we, we, we did very well with the use of uh, seat belts in cars. You know, we, we can use the same thing that we did then. That's well, a great point. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts, for joining us this morning on The Morning Show. Thank you for your time and insights.